I tell you, we just welcome all of you. And uh, we especially welcome the Crisp and the Marino family and all the friends. Thank you all for coming this morning. It is a special occasion, praise God. We'll talk about that in just a minute because uh, we want uh, other people to see what we're, what we're doing here. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Everybody comfortable? Everybody good? Amen. Hallelujah. Two minutes. Okay. Well, it's like I was, tell, I was telling uh, Suzanne and them this morning, hey, listen, uh, we just want you to feel at home. Uh, you know, I was telling them how in the scriptures it talks about Paul would always greet the church at so-and-so's house. Greet the church or salute the church at so-and-so's house. Because most of the time the churches gathered in homes back then. That was the custom. And, I mean, they had a synagogue, but most of the churches gathered in the homes. So I tell people, listen, just, we want you to be just like you come over to the house. I want you to be comfortable and, and relax. You know, we're going to get into some things here in just a few minutes, uh, what the Lord has led us. But like the Hebrew word for heal, uh, healing, if you, if you look at it, of course, Hebrew goes from right to, right to left, backwards point what we do. But part of the, the root words in the word heal or healing in Hebrew is to relax. It means to relax. When well, you think about it, dis-ease. Dis, disease, dis ease. Well, to relax is to be at ease. Remember, Jesus said, "Come to me, all you that are heavy laden." He said, "Come and learn of me. My, I'm, I'm low, lowly and meek at heart, but I want you to learn from me." I liked, I liked, I think one of the translations said, "He says, come and, and take a real rest, and enter into the unforced rhythms of grace." Hallelujah. So that's what we're entering in here today. He loves us so. We got, we got a lot of our church family watching us online. Still got several people who prefer to watch online, uh, and that's fine. Praise God. And they'll be joining us here in just a second when Sean gives me the countdown. But, uh, but praise the Lord. We're glad you're here. And uh, like I said, we have a special occasion this morning. Praise God. Let's, let's, just, let's just pray here. Father, we just thank you this morning. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you that you look upon this moment. You're totally aware of, of where we are. Your eyes run to and fro. And we thank you. Praise God. You know all things. Holy Spirit, thank you. You're the one here today who is our great helper. As we sing about the great comforter. And we trust you today to, to help us. And to not only to minister uh, through us. But to bring light and, and revelation and understanding. To make known everything that Jesus is to us today. And to honor and glorify him in our lives. As Paul prayed that we may be glorified in him and he be glorified in us. This day, we thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. And we welcome all of you who are uh, watching us on Facebook. Uh, good morning. Welcome to Grace Family Church. We believe you're in the right place at the right time. Here with us here. Uh, all of our church family and our friends. And uh, those of you who, who may even be watching us, uh, maybe for the first time, or you may be watching us at a, a later date, welcome. Welcome this morning. We've got a special treat for you, praise God. Uh, we're going to kick this thing off with a baby dedication. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm telling you, yeah, give it, amen. This, this, this is special. This is special. Yes, it is a special time. You know, let, let me read a scripture to you. Um, and if you have your Bibles, you want to turn there, let's go to uh, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, this is a cross-reference to what Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus where he told the fathers, he said, Fathers, don't provoke your children unto wrath, but bring your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And really this scripture, bringing your children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, is really a cross-reference to what took place in Timothy's life. Okay? Now we all know about the story of, of Hannah in the Bible. Uh, Hannah was barren. She longed for a child. Her uh, husband had another wife. She, he, he had two wives. One of them was Hannah. Uh, the other wife uh, bore him children, but Hannah's womb was shut up. And his custom was that he'd go to uh, and worship each and every year, and she'd go into the temple. Of course, Eli was the priest at that time. He had two sons. And we know the story there where uh, her heart was so longing for a child that Eli even noticed that she would be praying, her mouth would be moving, but he couldn't hear no words. He thought she was drunk, the scripture says. She says, no, I've not been, I've not been drinking any wine or strong drink. 
But she had such a longing. And he told her, he said, uh, the Lord's going to grant your petition. And of course, we know Samuel was born. But you know what she did? She told the Lord uh, before this, she said, Lord, if you'll grant unto me a man child, I'll give him back to you. You know, children are the heritage of the Lord. They're his. You remember uh, the psalmist said, uh, he said, we are the sheep. It's the Lord that has made us and not we ourselves. We are the sheep of his pasture. You know, I've told this as a pastor. Uh, I know sometimes pastors get very protective, and you are to be protective. You don't want any wolves coming in and harming your, your flock. But here's the thing about it. Uh, you're not mine. You're his. Now, I have a responsibility that he's entrusted me with, but, but you're not my sheep. You're his. You're the sheep of his pasture. You belong to him. Uh, Paul said it like this to the church. He said, you've, you've been bought with a price. See, I didn't pay for you. I didn't buy you, even though I'm a pastor and I'm under chapter, but I didn't buy you. I didn't pay for you. He paid for you. And he paid for you with his blood. Amen. And you're his. But we know this. She said, Lord, if you'll grant him to me, I'll, I'll give him to you. Now, he, he allows us to raise them. And, and we'll, they'll always be a part of our our, 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 our lives. Even, I don't care how old mamas get, right, Jean Ann? They're still your babies, right? I don't care when they grow up and they get out of the house and they go to college and all this other, and they marry and all this other. I mean, this right, guys? They're still, they're still your babies. It doesn't matter. And, and that's right. And God gives us that. But we always must remember, He bought us. He paid for us. It all, we're all created for His pleasure, the Scripture says. Mm, he loves us so much. He loves us so much, and he loves uh, Gabriella Grace Marino so much. Praise God. Let's read this scripture right here. You know what happened when, when, when she got a petition? Did she follow up with what she told the Lord? Hannah, I'm talking about? Absolutely. She went back in, and she dedic what we call dedicated him. The King James said lent. <laughs> lent. Uh, we, she gave him from her heart. She entrusted him with God. And that's what we're doing this morning, guys. This is what this is all about. Let me say something to you guys. Just like God w looked upon the moment when y'all were married and you had family and friends together. It's good to see the fam here. I hadn't seen them since the, you know, the wedding, but I'm saying, you know, just like the Lord looked on that moment, he's looking on this moment right now concerning her. Because this promise is to you and to your children, and to your children's children. Amen. Let's read the scripture, and then we'll, I'll call them up, and we'll pray over them. 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 3, verse 14, he says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child, from a child, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise, unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Um, let me tell you, I think it was Timothy's mother who was Jew, Jewish. His daddy was not. But she knew the scriptures, and she knew about Hannah. And yet, Paul referred to Timothy in a time in his life. He said, I've seen your tears. And he said, I want you to stir up the gift of God that's in you. He said, because this stuff was in your granny, and it was in your mama, and I'm convinced that it's in you too. I'm the, that's Roger's translation. <laughs> Paraphrase. From a child, from that age, even at birth even, even in, listen, can we believe that the Spirit of God can affect a child in a mother's womb? Absolutely. John the Baptist was filled with the Spirit in his mother's and Elizabeth's womb. God can go to the womb and affect a child. I, I'm already getting chicken skin, guys. Y'all are going to have to forgive me. I'm already getting goosey bumps up here because this is special. He looks on this moment. We're not just doing something to be doing something. I mean, this is divine stuff. This is Holy Ghost stuff, just like we see it with Hannah. Amen? From a child. Y'all come on up, guys. Come on up here. Praise the Lord. 
Amen. And I'm telling you guys online there, y'all just, y'all with us? Y'all join in with us? Hey, sweet girl. Hey, everybody. I'll tell you what, y'all come around here in front. Let's get in the front. I want to, I want to show her off. Amen. <laughs> this is Gabriella Grace Marino, Anthony and Stephanie. Sometimes I call her Steph, you know, we just call her Steph. Praise the Lord. Precious, precious, precious. Will y'all join with me this morning as we acknowledge the Lord? Because I'm going to put my hands on her and I'm going to put my hands on the parents. Amen. Father, we just thank you. We acknowledge you. We thank you that you do look upon this moment. Oh, what a blessing. What a blessing that our children are. What a blessing that our grandchildren are, our great-grandchildren. Oh, Lord, you're, you're a father. You're the one who instituted family. You're the one who instituted marriage. And we thank you. And yet, Lord, we see the pattern in your word where parents would, would not only train their child in the way they should go, but they would raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And they would bring them to you and, and pray over them and dedicate them to you, Lord. So we thank you for that this morning. Praise God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just put my hands on Gabriella Grace. In the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord. And along with these parents, Lord, I just thank you. We pray over her, and we, Father God, commit her into thine hand. We thank you for your grace that is upon her. We thank you, Lord God, from, from, from this, not even before this moment, your hand has been upon her. You've watched over, you've kept her. Your spirit, Lord, your spirit, your wonderful spirit has sustained her. And Lord, we continue to look to you in the days to come, in the years to come in her life. We thank you. We ask that you would uh, watch over her. We, we ask and, and we call for the ministering spirits of God, those that have been assigned to her, even from her birth, to help her. To carry out the divine plan and purpose that you have for her life. All the days of her life. And I pray for Anthony and Steph. Lord, also that you would grant unto them by the Holy Ghost. You would inspire them. Show them. Help them. In raising her. Hallelujah. Showing them. Uh, I mean, ministering things to them. Putting things in, in, in their hearts. Showing them things before it even happens. Praise God. So, Father God, that not only do they pray, but they're able to speak and declare things over her as she continues to grow in grace and to grow in you. We thank you for this moment, Lord. We thank you for it. We dedicate her to you. Yes, we thank you that she's yours. We thank you that you paid for her. You knew that she would come to this earth. And you bought and paid for her with your precious blood. And I thank you that through that, She's redeemed, kept, protected all the days of her life. We bless her. We speak blessing over her. We pray, Lord God, we speak health and strength over her all the days of her life. That she will prosper and be in health. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Praise God. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, I, I believe. You know, I, I get stirred up again. Do you, you know, Jacob was a deceiver, but he wanted that blessing, didn't he? From his brother. You know why? Now, this is under an old covenant. Now, you think about this with me. Once those words were spoken... Ain't no turning back. Those words would be carried out because somebody said words. Even the angel came to Peter and then uh, he fell into a trance in the Spirit of God and, and all told him, he said, you're going to have to go to Cornelius' house and you're going to have to tell him words. Words are going to have to be spoken because that will bring salvation to their lives. Not just for the new birth experience, when words are spoken and declared in faith, and God inspires those words, those words are spirit, and they are life, and they're eternal. Because spirit is eternal. Jesus said, my words are spirit, and they are life. 
That's why even in the book of Proverbs, it says death and life are in the power of the tongue. Mm. I believe what we said. I believe she'll, she'll grow and, and she'll be strong and healthy and she'll prosper. I'm talking about godly prospering. The prosperity of God upon her life. All the days of her life. And the Spirit of God will help Anthony and Steph all the days of their life to raise her. Grandparents too, y'all are included in this. Don't, yeah, that's right. Don't, don't exclude, exclude y'all guys. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. You got your Bibles? Let's go to Matthew. Let's shift gears here for a few minutes. I won't try to keep you long. I know uh, uh, I, I was wondering if my stomach growling was coming across the mic there just a minute ago. You know, when we were praying, I'm like, oh, <laughs> I'm going to have to talk a little louder. So praise the Lord. Let's go to Matthew chapter 9. Last week, we started a new series on healing. And I wanted to get into a few of those things. We'll, we'll, we'll go back over a couple of things. But let's go to Matthew chapter 9. And then we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 13. Two uh, scriptures here we're going to look at. This is sort of our text. Let me get to them myself. Matthew 9. Matthew 9 and then Hebrews 13. We'll go to Matthew 9 first. Matthew chapter 9. Verse 35, it says, And Jesus went about all the cities and villages. How many cities and villages? All of them. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. He Hebrews chapter 13, the 8th verse, says that Jesus Christ, we were singing about this earlier, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus is the same Yesterday, today, and forever. And we see here in Matthew chapter 9 that Jesus went about teaching, preaching, and healing. And he did this in every city, in every village. And he was moved with compassion on people because he saw people as he was ministering to them, as he was teaching, as he would look into their faces. You know, he perceived things. He knew things. And yet he would look at people and he was moved because he saw them in their lives and where they were. And he had compassion on them. And he said, listen, guys, let's pray that God would send forth laborers into the harvest. Number one, those laborers could be, you know, when sheep have no shepherd, that, that could apply to people who need pastors after God's own heart that would minister and teach and preach to them and be able to also uh, minister the word of healing to them. Because this is the threefold ministry of Jesus, guys. If you want to break down his ministry, it's all right here in Matthew 9, 35. Jesus went about teaching, preaching, and healing. And Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, Jesus told us in John chapter 14, he said, The works that I do, you shall do also. In Acts chapter 13, after, Paul, uh, after Saul's conversion, he became Paul. The Bible tells us that they were all in a, uh, there was five of them together, prophets and teachers. Uh, the Bible tells us it started with Saul and ended with Barnabas. And they all were uh, ministering to the Lord. They were fasting and praying and ministering to the Lord. And the Bible says the Holy Ghost spoke and said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, unto the work. Unto the work that I've called them to. Jesus said, the works that I do, you shall do also. He's talking about to believers now, not just to, to Paul and Barnabas. What, what works were those that, that Paul and Barnabas did? They went about teaching and preaching and healing. You know, when we teach the Word of God, we're doing the works of Jesus. When we're proclaiming or telling the good news to people, we're doing the works of Jesus. But also when we pray for people and minister healing to people, you know, part of the Great Commission is to, in His name, is to lay hands on people and pray for them. That's part of the Great Commission. Okay? If there's ever a time in our life that we need 
to be open and receptive and establish our hearts in the truth of God's Word, especially in this area, it's now. There's so much fear out there just because of this pandemic and even before that. But it's, listen, guys, like I said, the Scripture tells us that things will wax worse and worse towards the end. But see, we're the body of Christ. We're the bride. There's a grace and a power that's upon the church. The Bible says in the book of Acts that great grace and great power was upon the church. Just like under the old covenant, listen, the lights shined in Goshen when it was dark in Egypt. That's a type and a shadow. There's things that, that it's not that we're better than anybody or that God loves us anymore. God so loved the world that he gave. But let me tell you something. When, when, you, when, you, when you become part of the family, you get, you get a few benefits. If you don't believe that, just ask Gabriella Grace. Ask this family right here what kind of benefits she gets versus just somebody out there that you don't know in the world. That doesn't mean you don't dislike people in the world, that you don't love people in the world, but hey, she, she's part of the fam. You see what I'm saying? But Jesus went about it, teaching, preaching, and healing. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The difference now is that when he walked the earth, he was the only body of Christ that walked the earth. He was the only body of Christ. Paul says now that we are the body of Christ and we're members in particular. We're the only, the church is the only body of Christ. Jesus is a man. He's still a man. There's a man in the Godhead right now. There's one mediator between, between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He has a glorified body. We're going to get one one day, just like his. He could walk through a wall and sit down and eat fish with his disciples. See, his body, his resurrected body, is the type of body we will get when we're resurrected. I'm talking about when the grave's open. The dead in Christ shall rise first. That's, that's the kind of body we're going to get. That's what the rapture is all about. The rapture, we call it the rapture, but really it's the event where we get our glorified bodies. We've got the earnest, the down payment on that now. But the redemption of our bodies will take place. Won't be any more bad days. No more pain. Won't, you won't feel bad. Won't age. Jesus, Jesus is actually at the right hand of the Father right now. I'm talking about in a physical glorified body. Your body has to be glorified to be in that presence with God. You remember in the old covenant, without that body being glorified, if you touch the ark and that presence, guess what happens to you? You're toast. You're crispy critter. But see, with a glorified body, you can be in that presence. You can be in that glory. He's actually at the right hand of the Father right now. With a risen, glorified body. Physical body. Remember when he appeared, he said, touch me. He said, flesh and bone. He said, it's not, I'm not a spirit. Handle me. Touch me. Matter of fact, he had to prove it to him. He said, hey guys, you got anything to eat? They said, well, we got a little, we got a little honeycomb, fish. He said, well, give, give me some of it. I'll prove it to you. His physical body is at the right hand of the Father. But we're his body in the earth today. And we're, to, we're ambassadors. We're representatives of heaven. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But we're co-laborers together with him now down here, Paul said. It's very important. Now, last week we talked about some things. Oh, me. Hallelujah. The biggest thing that we deal with in this area, and we're, and we're going to get into this more and we're going to take our time in this because it's so, so important. Because our hearts have to be established. Why? Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 10, with the heart, man believes. The Bible tells us we have to guard our heart or keep our heart with all diligence. For out of it, out of your heart, flow the issues or forces of life. So what's in your heart matters. What your heart is established in matters. What you think in your heart matters. 
most of the people, well, I'll say most of the people, I, I'm, I'm going to say most, but I'll say a lot of people, even Christians, question at times whether it's God's will to heal. If it be God's will. A lot of times when people get in this area and they've they got issues in their body or they've got situations going on, some people still, that question mark comes up. Well, if it's the Lord's will. We just pray, you know, we, we want God's will. We're just praying for God's will to be done. I can't tell you how many times um, I've heard that. But let me say something to you. Jesus Christ is the expressed image of God. You remember Philip in the upper room said, Lord, show us the Father. Because he was talking about the Father. And, and Jesus said, Philip, have I not, I've been with you all this time. Don't you understand when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And the scripture tells us more than once that Jesus is the expressed image. You know, sometimes when you have kids, they'll say, he or she is the spitting image of her mama or her daddy. You ever heard that before? Well, down here in the South, I'm not going to say Jesus is a spitting image because people think I'm blaspheming or showing disrespect, but I'll tell you this. We'll take the word spitting out. Jesus is the exact. How about that? He's the exact image of God. If you really want to know what God is like, you have to look at Jesus. Because Jesus brought forth the true revelation of who God is. Because in the upper room, twice before he went to the, to the cross, he said, Father, he said it like he said, I have declared your name to them. Another verse, he says, I have manifested your name to them. What was that name? It wasn't Jehovah. It wasn't El Shaddai. It wasn't El Elyon. It wasn't Adonai. The name that he revealed to them and declared to them was Father. It's the very thing that the Pharisees wanted to kill him over. They said, we want to hurt you for a lot of things that you, that, that you say and do. But the main thing we want to take you out on is because you call him Father. Isn't that something? I, I know that sounds crazy, but that's what they said. You make yourself equal with him when you call him your Father. And yet that's the very thing that he came to reveal to the world about God. That he was not only a creator, but he was a daddy. And Paul said, like the, said it like this to the church now. He said, now we have the spirit of adoption. We have the spirit that cries in our hearts, hearts, Abba, Abba. You know what Abba means? Daddy. 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 He's my daddy. Does he love me? Absolutely. How do I know he loves me? Because everything's going okay in my life? Because I don't ever have a problem? If I have a problem, then he, don't love, he doesn't love me or he doesn't care about me. I wonder if God really, really does love me because, you know, I've been in this situation for a while now and it don't seem to change. So uh, I really question whether the Lord really loves me or, or hears my prayers. No. You do not get... The definition of God's love. You do not define God's love based on experience or circumstance. Whether it's good or bad. You get your definition of God's love from the cross. That's where you get your revelation and understanding of God's love is through Calvary. Paul said it like this in Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. He said, the life that I now live. He said, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. But the life that I now live while I'm walking down here in this flesh, here's how I live it. I live it. I breathe it, think it, eat it. I live it by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Hmm. The biggest thing we're going to deal with over the next few weeks, it's going to take us a little time, is we're going to deal with this thing about the will of God. And I, I just ask all of us not just to think, well, you know, I've heard this. You know, I, I know this. I, I, I know, I know. Listen, I can't tell you how many times I've sat down with people and people in a, in a, in a, got a mess going on in their life and you try to share a scripture with them and they go, yeah, I, I know, but... I, 
And they'll, they'll say they know that, and then they'll go, but, you know, and they'll just go right back into their problem. And in like, the very thing that is the answer that the Spirit of God quickens in you to tell them that that's their answer, they just, it just goes right over them. No, I, I, I pray this for myself. Lord, help me. You know, I, I said this very, uh, this very thing last week, very transparent. I've humbled myself and said, Lord, teach me, help me in this area. I, I want to know how to receive better. If Paul says he's not attained or arrived, and he, that he's still pressing toward the mark, I mean, I, I, mean I, I think I can still continue. I mean, he wrote, I mean, he's the one who wrote over half the epistles to the church, and yet he said, I've not attained. I'm not, it's not like I've already attained everything. Listen, we don't, listen we're learning more. Now listen, we don't know everything. Nobody will know everything on this side, the Scripture tells us. But we can know enough. We can know enough to walk as he walked. The Bible tells us we're to walk as he walked. Why would God tell us to walk as he walked, and yet it's impossible to do that? He would be unjust and unfair to tell us that we could if we couldn't. But he's not unjust and he's not unfair. Matter of fact, he's given us the helper to reveal things to us and to help us and expound these things in us. Now, the first thing we looked at last week is in John 17, 3. Y'all ready to go there? Let's go there right quick. Oh, I got to move and groove here. John 17, 3. Very important. I, I've got to say this because we're just family, right? Um, Evan, I know Steph's back there. Um, when I had the, the wonderful privilege of being a children's pastor many years ago in the early 90s. I still remember him when he was just a little. I asked the Lord. I'd never done children's ministry. I knew God had opened up an opportunity for, opportunity for me at that church. You know, I was telling you earlier how the Lord rescued me 36 years ago in a month. And I remember one of the first services I got into, I actually went to the building over there off of, uh, in Huffman, off Center Point Parkway, but it wasn't the church at that time that we attended. It was uh, a Huffman assembly. Gary McSpadden was singing in, in that service. And I went over there. I never, listen, you got to understand something, folks. I mean, as a child, I, I was in church you know, but I got away from the Lord for 13 years. I was, I was gone for 13 years of my life till I was in my mid-20s. And so I come back, and all I know is what I can remember as a child, soda. you know. Because after 12 years old, when I turned 13, it was over, you know. Our home split. Division came. The enemy came in. And then we, listen, you know, it's not good. But, but God... I'm telling you, that seed's incorruptible. The thing you put in your kids, Anthony, it's incorruptible. It lives and abides forever. It's, it's an incorruptible seed. Oh, hallelujah. So, anyway, I get over there. I know the Lord gives me an opportunity. Uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, going back to the Gary McSpadden deal, I went to that service. I walked in that service, and I, man, I, never, I never felt anything like that before. I mean, these people, I actually, actually, I didn't say this out loud, but I thought this. And here's what I thought. I thought, dear God, these people actually act like he's in the building. <laughs> that, 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 that's what I thought. I, that's, I mean, I'm thinking, dear God, these, these people act, act like he's here. Like he's actually, like he's physically here. I mean, I didn't say to nobody because I was about half nervous. And, I, you know, and I didn't want to, because I'd never been in a church service other than what I knew. I grew up in a, denom, a denominational background. Is everything was just quiet and easy and, you know, we don't rock the boat. Don't rock the boat, baby. You know, so we don't rock the boat spiritually. 
And I walk in, and these people were rejoicing and worshiping. And it wasn't a bunch of running around screaming. You know, it wasn't wild, but I could tell it was heart, heartfelt. And it did something in me. I remember walking out of the, uh, the church service, and, 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 and I told Dana, I said, I don't care if I have to drive to this parking lot to get what this is, I, I'll do it. I didn't realize I was prophesying to myself. I actually drove three and a half years. We lived probably 10 miles, or not quite 10 miles, seven or eight miles from, from here, west, and I drove from that dwelling to that parking lot for three and a half years back before they put in the corridor. And we were there every Sunday and every Sunday night and every Wednesday. Didn't know it. I'll tell you what, God will set you up. But anyway, I got the opportunity, Evan. And I remember the pastor called me in his office and he said, here's what he said. He said, it just seems me good to me and the Holy Ghost that you're the children's pastor here. And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> I knew it was, was God. And then I, then I walked out of that place. And this, this, is, this is, God is my witness. I am not exaggerating. This is exactly what I'm thinking. What did I just do? I've never been in children's ministry. Dan and I, we don't even have any kids. The only thing I know is I was a kid once. <laughs> but I don't remember a whole lot about that. Because the substance abuse and alcohol and all that stuff, it'll take your memory away from you. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, what do I do? What do I do? Plus the previous guy that was the children's pastor, he was the next Willie George <laughs> in waiting. <laughs> I mean, you know, he, you know, he was just so good and everybody loved them and he was wonderful. You know, and then, you know, as we always think, Lord, I, I, how can I walk in his shoes or feel his shoes? We're, we're not to walk in his shoes or feel his shoes. But I, you know, I'm just all these things. I'm thinking, oh Lord, what do I do? So I, there was a prayer room in that church up at the top, up at the top of the building. There was a prayer room. So I, I made a beeline. I walked out of the office and I, and I made a beeline for that prayer room. And I said, oh God, <laughs> what do I do? And the Lord spoke this scripture to me. You want to you read it? John chapter 17. You ready? Ready, Evan? John 17. Let's, let's start in verse 1. And, and these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son that thy Son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as, as thou hast given him. Now notice here he calls it eternal life in verse 2. In verse 3, he says, and this is life eternal. He just turned it around, but it's the same thing. This is eternal life. This is the scripture the Lord spoke to me. He, made, uh, he, he just quickened, opened your Bible, and went to J John chapter 3. And here's what he said. He said, Roger, every parent, every parent, if you ask them the most important thing, the, the most important thing they want for their children is eternal life. Because there comes a time when our children grow up, you know. And as Fleetwood Mac used to sing, they just to go their own way. Not all. But when you get up and you get that age, you don't have the authority over them that you, you had when they were little. And he said, son, the most important thing for, the, for a parent is they would know that their children have eternal life. Well, I always took that as that means you, if something happens to your kid one day, you want to make sure they go to heaven. Well, that's true. And that's a part of eternal life. But notice what Jesus said eternal life is. Let's see if he says it's going to heaven. This is eternal life. What is eternal life, Jesus? Let me ask you all a question. Can we get beyond tradition and what mama said and what granny thought and Aunt Susie and go to the Bible? What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? What did he say eternal life is? You know, the only reason I say this, guys, listen, I'm... Is I, I say it because 
I want us to be open and receptive and not get over into that deal of like, well, I know. I already know that. I, 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 I know that. You know, I, I said this last week. And I made reference to a, a week ago last night. Uh, my wife fixed a, what we call a good old country dinner. And listen, and I'm telling you right now, listen, I, I know, I know. But I made reference that she, you know, she fried okra. I mean, fresh garden okra. I, I'm not talking about stuff you get out of a bag frozen. Purple whole peas. I'm not talking about down here that you go in the grocery store and get. I'm talking about coming out of the ground here recently. Fresh pone of cornbread. Slice onions. I mean, you get all that stuff up, you start whipping all that. When she, she, when I walked into the kitchen and she said, honey, I've got, the, I didn't go, I don't want that. I've already had that. I had that a year ago. I had that at the first of the year. I, I, let's come closer. Uh, no, I had that, I had that two months ago. I, I want something else. Is that what you do? Well, well, if we don't do that in the natural, why would we treat something like that in the spirit? And let's say I've taught on a subject two months ago or, or beginning of the year, and yet we're going to delve back in it again, and people go, they don't say it, but on the inside they go, I mm, wish he would teach something else. I wish he would teach something else. We, we, we've already heard that. Well, you don't treat natural food that way. Well, why would you? No, hey, I'm getting a witness over here, over here, right here. I'm getting a witness over here in the corner over here. I get a little, no, that's right, right there. We don't need to treat spiritual food that way. No, praise God, we need to be open and receptive to things. Eternal life. Let me, let me get back over here. I, I, I get off on a little side, which sometimes those are good and we need them. But let me get back on the deal. The Lord said, every parent's desire for their children is to have eternal life. Jesus said right here, and this is eternal life, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. So what does Jesus say eternal life is? It's knowing God and knowing him. Did he say anywhere about getting to go somewhere when you die one day? Now, is that included? Yes. If you pin me down and ask me what's the most important, yes. You're not going to get any debate out of me that the most important thing is for a person to be saved and be born again. And yes, if some, for some reason something happens to him here on this earth, then yes, heaven is their home. Absolutely. No arguments here. But Jesus said eternal life is knowing God. John wrote a, wrote a letter to the church here, the same author. Wrote a letter to the church in, the, in, in 1 John chapter 4. And he said, and we have believed and known the love that God has toward us. God is love. Why am I using these scriptures? Because the Lord quickened this to me from the very outset in the beginning of laying a foundation in this series about healing. If people don't know God, if, they don't, if they're not walking in the eternal life that Jesus talked about, then they'll question God. When you hear things, well, it, we'll, we'll pray about this situation, but we'll just pray if it's God's will. If you pray, let, let me say, don't ever pray if it's God's will when it comes to healing. Because it is his will. And we're going to look at the scriptures and see. One of the first cases we see is a leper in the Bible. He had that question, didn't he? He came to the Lord and he said, Lord, if thou wilt, or, or if you will, you can make me clean. Jesus said, I will. Reached out and touched him. We're, go we're going to get into this. One translation says, Lord, if you want to, you can make me clean. And he reached and touched him and said, I want. One translation is he said, of course, of course I want to. If anybody comes to Jesus concerning healing in their body 
And if Jesus answers any other thing, now I want you to listen to him. Look, look right here. Look right here at me in the camera. If anybody comes to Jesus concerning healing, and Jesus says any other thing except, of course I will, of course I want to, then Jesus Christ is not the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let me give you another one. Romans chapter 8. Paul said, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us Three things, some things, all things. So let me say it to you like this. What does that scripture mean to me? How does the Holy Spirit bring that to me in this area of healing? Jesus, God did not spare him. In other words, he did not withhold his son. Well, how, what does Jesus compare to, to other things? Is he less than or is he above all? The Bible says he's above all. So if God would not withhold Jesus, which is above all, or his best, if he withholds anything from you, or if he withholds healing from you, if it's not his will and he withholds it from you, then he thinks more about healing than he does his son because he didn't withhold his son. Did he? And yet, we're dealing with this issue. You remember, we ended up last week, and at the end of the service, I told you there's three things that make the word of God of no effect, and we're going to deal with these things. Number one is unbelief. I'm talking about this is scriptural. Number two, the traditions of men. Make the word of God of none effect. That's what Jesus said. And number three, Christ becomes of no effect to you who are under the law. And we're going to deal with all three areas. I'm going to leave you with this today. Ready? You know, Evan, do you remember we used to do object, le- object lessons in children's church? You know, we'd have object lessons. we have all kinds of stuff we'd do. I've got an object lesson this morning. It came to the church. And the Lord, I really wasn't thinking about it, but the Lord showed me the object, le- object lesson that was in my notes here. I've got it. It's in my notes. It's one of my next points. Matter of fact, I'm skipping down a little bit so I can get to it because I want to close this out. It wasn't actually my next point in my notes, but it is on my first page. And when you guys showed up this morning, he said, your object lesson's here, right here. You're part of it, Anthony. You ready? I love Jesus. He is so cool. He is so full of wisdom. You know, they'd come and try to trick him and ask him questions. Sometimes Mike and all of a sudden he'd say, well, I'll answer your question with a question. And they would go, "Uh, let me get back with you on that. Because it was the wisdom of God. And they didn't know how to deal with it. One of the things we want to address is this thing called tradition. Because I can't tell you how many millions of people, even today and even in the church, still have the question in their heart, well, maybe, it, maybe it's God's will. Maybe he, it wasn't his will to do this. Maybe he has a purpose in this. Maybe there's some, a reason why. But see... Remember, Jesus is the expressed image of the the Father. If you never see it in the life and ministry of Jesus, then disregard the tradition. I've never seen Jesus at one time when people would come, and I'm talking about sick people, that when they come to him, he'd go, no, I can't pray for you. I really can't pray for you because, you know, God, God may have a reason in this. There's a purpose that the Father has in this. The Father may be wanting to teach you something. You ever see any scriptures like that? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Then where do we get that stuff from? Jesus said it's the tradition of you. Family, friends, 
that cause the Word of God to not be effective in your life. Now, we're going to deal with this stuff. You know, I, I got scripture where Paul would go into the synagogue and he would reason with them from the scriptures. In other words, let me say it to you like this. He would give them reasons from the scriptures and show them things in the scriptures about how that Jesus died and suffered and that how he was raised the third day to bring salvation and redemption to us. And he would reason with them and, and show them scriptures. I, I'm going to show you several reasons why it's the will of God. Not, not a couple. But we'll start with this. Ready? Let's close this out right quick. Go with me. To, you're right there in John. Back up. Take a left to chapter 3. And then we'll get to our object lesson. Wonderful example. You, you know, I told you earlier, the Holy Ghost will set you up. Well, he just set up my teaching this morning. You'll get it here in just a second, Anthony. Look here in verse 12. You remember, this is the story when Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and uh, had some questions for him. And then Jesus said this in verse 12. He said, If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? I want to say that again. Jesus basically said, If I have told you earthly things and you believe not. Well, the purpose of the earthly things was to, to help them do what? Believe. He said, how can I tell you spiritual things? Listen, Jesus used natural things or earthly things to teach spiritual truths. To get people to believe. He says, if I'm telling you earthly things or using natural illustrations and you won't believe, how can I take you to the next step? You know, Jesus wants to carry us to places that he don't have to even compare natural things to. But he does that to help us because he loves us. And he, he gave natural illustrations in his teachings. <laughs> Let's go back to the beginning and look at one. You ready? And, and keep in mind, this is dealing with the tradition of if it's God's will to heal. Or maybe God has a purpose in this. Or maybe there's a reason. We just don't know why. You never know. You never know what God's going to do. All kinds of stuff we deal with. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 7. Listen, we're going to get to the place. Listen, we're dealing with the heart and the want to of God. What's really been in his heart from the get-go. And Jesus displayed this. Now we know post the cross that Jesus has already redeemed us. And by his stripes we were healed. You know, Isaiah prophesied about what Jesus would do in Isaiah 53. He said, talking about he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised, and by his stripes we are healed. Peter looks back on that moment in 1 Peter and says, you know, who his own self bare our sins on the body, in, in his own body on the tree. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live under righteousness, by whose stripes you were. He's looking back. Okay? So we'll deal with that when we get into some other things down the road. But right now, we want to deal with tradition, and we really want to reveal the heart of God to people. Because, see, eternal life is knowing God and, and truly knowing Jesus. Because if you truly know God, you won't question his will or his want to. You won't question his heart if you know him. Anybody that questions his will to heal, I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings, but you're just telling me you really don't know him. You're not walking in eternal life. John said, we have, we, not only do we believe, we've known the love that God has toward us. God is love. And yet Jesus turns around and says, I've used natural things to try to get you to believe some things, guys. And if you won't believe them, how can I tell you some things without even using natural illustrations to show you some stuff? His desire is to not even have to have use natural things. He can, he can just speak to us in our spirit and, and bring things to us, and we receive it. We don't question it. That doesn't mean we don't go to the Scripture and back out, you know, and, 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 and know that the Scripture backs what God is speaking to our heart, what we feel like the Holy Spirit is saying to us. I had a lady text me a few days ago. She said, I heard the Lord speak this to me. Is this correct? Well, I gave her scripture for it. 
And the scripture I gave her had the exact words that the Lord spoke to her. The exact words. Not something, not a paraphrase. The exact words. I said, here's the scripture. I said, I believe you can go with what you heard. Because you got scripture. The Holy Spirit's never going to speak things and lead you in areas that you don't have scripture for. Because the Spirit and the Word agree. Now, let's get to this issue. Let's, let's look at an earthly, let's look at an earthly example that the Lord used to get people to believe. To believe what? To believe God. To know God. He came to manifest and declare his name as Father. Ready? Verse 7. Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son asks red, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? Verse 11, if you then be an evil. The word evil just means natural, earthly, carnal. Natural. If you be an natural, earthly, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more? What is, how mu what is much more? Is that equal or is it more? How much more? Shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask Him? So, see, He's declaring the Father. He's already mentioned the word Father. This was in the Sermon on the Mount. This is, out of, this is right out of the gate. This is, this is the get-go. This is like at the dog track, horse track. Doom, I mean, here they come, right out of the gate. Here He comes. Here He comes, declaring, talking about something earthly, natural, to get people to believe. To believe what? but to believe in God as a father, not just a creator. And to reveal his father to humanity. Jesus said that he came and part of his mission was to reveal the father. I got to ask you a question. I got to get into the, the, the specifics here. When that precious girl was born. There were some complications, weren't there, Anthony? I remember. i got to ask you a question. You being natural, earthly, parent, what was your want to? What was your will for that girl? Take her home. Was, was, it, was it at any moment, or was there any moment in, in you and Steph's mind and heart that it was not your will or your want to, for her to be, to be healed? Hmm. So there was ne John. Uh, well, come here. Turn the camera over here. Come over here. Come over here. Come, 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 come. I got to get closer. So I want, I want this on record. There was never one moment or time in your heart, in Steph's heart, concerning your precious daughter, that it may, for some reason, you don't want her to be well or healed because maybe she, some point, y'all can learn something from it. She can learn something from it. God, you know, you, you, not God, let's leave God out of the picture because you, you would have a purpose in, in her being in that condition and, and staying in that condition with a possibility of her life ending. So that, that's, that, that, no. See, listen to me. That, that sounds crazy, doesn't it? I mean, we would look at that and go, what are you talking about? Have you lost your ever loving mind? Then where do we get where do we get the phrase if it be God's will when it comes to healing? Where did that come from? Yeah. You're exactly right, Lee. It came from the devil. Because Jesus said, if I tell you earthly things and you don't believe it, the only purpose of him telling earthly things was to get people to believe. Believe what? To believe and know God and to know Him and to receive and have eternal life. He said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I am come. Why did you come, Jesus? I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Don't ever pray 
if it be thy will when it comes to healing. For you or for anybody else. That's just one reason. That's right out of the gate. That God in human form stood and, and spoke to humanity. And even today would declare. I want you to understand and to know my father. I want you to know his heart and his will for you. Why? Because he loves us. It's like I said a while ago. He did not spare or withhold his best. If Jesus is the best and he's above all. Then if he withholds any other thing. He thinks more of that thing than he does his son. And I tell you right now, he don't think of anything more uh, that's greater than his son. Can you say amen? amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Hallelujah. We thank you this morning for this opportunity to minister things that we believe that you inspire. Father, I believe it comes from, from heaven. I believe it comes from your heart. I know, Lord, we've looked at your words. Your words are life to us. We thank you for it. Father, we thank you for it. not only what we've ministered here the last few minutes, but, Father, we thank you for what took place in this service today when we brought Gabriella Grace before you and we lifted her before your throne. And we, we know that you looked upon this moment. And we, not only did I speak words over her, but literally what I, I did was just in total agreement with her parents and with her grandparents and her family, her loved ones. We're in agreement here. And we thank you. These words are sealed in the name of Jesus concerning her by the Spirit of God. For that we are thankful. And Lord, we just bless you and thank you. Oh, hallelujah. Father, you know... You know before I pray any further, you know, I mentioned something here about eternal life. Eternal life is knowing God, but it does include going to heaven. We got other scriptures. We can go to other scriptures and look at things. We know that includes that. If you're watching online or even here, let's just, just take a moment. If, if you've not received eternal life, yes, maybe not knowing God the way uh, you would like to know him. But even greater than that. I mentioned Nicodemus. Nicodemus came to Jesus and asked him a question. And Jesus told him, he said, Nicodemus, first and foremost, he said, you must be born again. You must be born again. Nicodemus said, you mean I've got to go, in, go back into my mother's womb? What are you talking about? He said, no, Nicodemus, that's, that's being born of flesh, of the natural body. I'm talking about your spirit being born again. If you've never been born again, if you've never received Jesus and prayed and asked him to come into your heart and make all things new because you truly realize that you're lost and that he is your only way, that he is the Savior. If you've never invited him into your heart, even here, if you've never done that, then I ask you just to, to pray this with me. To pray this with me. Just pray it from your heart. Say, Father God, I come to you in Jesus' name. I call upon the name of Jesus. I believe on you, Lord Jesus. I ask you to come into my heart. Make me a new creation. Make things new in my heart. I thank you that you died for me. And that God raised you from the dead for me. And I receive you. As the gift of eternal life. Teach me now. Help me to know you more. Help me to see things I've never seen. To hear things I've never heard. From your word. And from your spirit. So that I may follow you. All the days of my life. In Jesus name. Amen. There's different ways to pray. I remember the story Brother Hagen told years ago. There was, a, was a, uh, a gentleman, and everybody in the community knew about this guy. And he was pretty row rowdy. People were sort of leery of him and sort of fearful of him. And he walked into a service, sat down, 
And the minister was ministering. Brother Hagin wasn't actually doing the service, but he was talking about it. The minister was preaching, and he talked about salvation. He, and he read the scripture, Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, at the end of the service, the guy got up, walked down to the front, and all of a sudden he said, Jesus! And that was it. He, yes, right. Yeah, he, uh, we hear that rain out there. He said, yes, Lord. He said, Jesus, like that. And all of a sudden, the preacher got, he, did, he sort of looked, and he's like, what are we doing? And then it dawned on him, this man has come, come down to receive, receive Christ. And so he called, he said, elders, y'all come down, let's pray for him. Let's pray for him, you know. Let's come down and pray for this man that he'd be saved. And, and the guy looked, and he said, why are you doing that for he said, you just, you just said that whosoever called on the name of the Lord shall be saved. I just called on Jesus. Is it, is it that simple? I'm talking about if it's, if it's from the heart. Absolutely. I'm reminded it's not really how long we can pray sometimes. It's how quick we can believe. That's what matters. Jesus didn't do a lot of long prayers when it comes to healing, didn't he? He said, rise up, take your bed. Be made whole, you know. That's it. He spoke those words. Boom, you know. You know why? Because he believed what he said would come to pass. And he had what he said, didn't he? Guys, thank you all for coming today. Man, I'm telling you, so good to see you all again. Thank you all for being patient with me. Thank you for being my good object lesson. Hallelujah. God loves us. We bless y'all that are watching. We love you in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us. We'll be back here Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Facebook Live. Have a great week. You're